I will start off by stating the obvious, that, as always, the ideas shared here are but my own homework notes and need contemplation on your part. And that I reaffirm that, since words cannot be truth, what I state is never to be assumed as such, although it is intended to point in a direction to be contemplated individually. Also, I state that I am by no means a health instructor, counselor or practitioner, so I am not offering advice regarding health, but will merely use an alternative way of viewing illnesses as a means to present a metaphor. The metaphor is more seen by me individually as an observed pattern repetition, perhaps in the style of as above so below, or inversely for the presentation as below so above whichever way you prefer. According to the basic precepts of German New Medicine, or GNM for short, founded by Reich Geert Hammer, after his own alternative research, illnesses that are not caused by poisons or violence are caused by psychosomatic shocks that affect an organ that is related to how that shocking event was taken in by the psyche subconsciously which is different for everyone. The same event can be interpreted by one as a uh, death fright and by another as a self-devaluation, for instance. Then, when the shock is activated, GNM states that the illness develops into two stages. The cold stage is when the shock or conflict is yet to be resolved, and so the organ in question will grow more cells than normal, to be able to deal with the perceived threat brought about by how the shock was perceived subconsciously. The hot stage emerges after the shock or conflict has been resolved, and so the extra cells that were produced for the perceived emergency can now be decomposed, being eaten away by bacteria and fungi that, when finished, will be washed away together with the decomposed leftovers excreted by the body in urine and feces. Also of importance for the metaphor is GNM's assertion that once an illness has been properly and completely dealt with by the body itself, the organ affected becomes stronger or healthier than previously. According to GNM, this only occurs when the disease was resolved without outside interference such as antibiotics, chemotherapy or radiotherapy that would kill the bacteria and fungi necessary for decomposing the extra mass after the conflict has been resolved. It is therefore worth noting that bacteria and fungi are, in the perspective of GNM, essential to restoring health. As an example for clarification, according to GNM, a tumor affecting the lung alveoli, that is, the cells in the lungs where actual breathing takes place, would be caused by a death fright shock that would be interpreted by the brain as not being able to take the next breath. So, in the cold phase of the disease, the shock would induce the production of extra cells of lung alveoli to allow the individual to have more usable surface in the lungs where breathing takes place, thus facilitating the resolution of the shock. Once the shock has been resolved, that is, the breath is taken in better, and the individual is no longer in death fright with the psychosomatic trouble breathing, the extra cells will infect with bacteria and or fungi to be decomposed. According to GNM, it's always the same type of bacteria and or fungi for the type of cells needed to be consumed, so there's a relationship between the tissue and the type of bacteria. Once the extra mass of cells is eaten without outside interference, both the leftover debris and the bacteria, or fungi, are excreted from the body and the lung alveoli are left stronger than before the illness. This presentation of GNM's ideas was necessary to be able to present the metaphor itself. So, with what was said before as a mere pattern guideline for comparison, let us imagine that this world is the home of the bacteria and fungi 
whose function it is to consume the leftover masses from previously resolved shocks and illnesses. In natural circumstances, we, as organs or cells of organs, would enter their realm, would have the unneeded sick extra mass decomposed and eaten away, and then, healthy and living again, we would return home. From the perspective of the bacteria and fungi, whenever there is a mass to consume, it is surely a feast, certainly looked at as a paradise of plenty. Now, imagine that there is an interference with this natural cycle. Imagine that an entity took over the bacteria and fungi and made them into a centralized swarm of obedient slaves. They struck a deal that the metaphorical bacteria and fungi could not refuse. Obey me, do exactly as I tell you when I tell you, and your paradise, your feast of tumors, will be eternal, with certain intervals in between that you must endure. The alternative the entity must have frightened them with is that when the feast is over, everyone is healthy and will go back to life, and you and your world of debris will be washed away, excreted into nothingness. The Hegelian dialectic has become famous in recent decades, representing the verifiable means with which the dark world authorities and rulers, yes, reference to Ephesians 6.12 here, not only prolong their power status, but also to promote the changes towards their agenda. The expression problem-reaction-solution came to define its core modus operandi, However, what if Hegelian dialectic is in fact the process of perpetuating tumors among the living by causing a shock, or the problem part, generating a conflict in our souls that promotes various growths, so to speak, to face the threat, or the reaction part, and also then afterwards presenting their resolution of the shock created in the first place, or the solution part. Once the shock is resolved, after the solution part is presented and implemented, using the metaphor of GNM, the hot phase of the healing process begins, with the extra growth in our souls that emerged during the reaction phase of the Hegelian dialectic, then available for consumption by the bacteria and fungi native to this realm. Another feast of festered soul made ready for them by the agreement or contract struck with the entity that has common interest in maintaining this realm going with itself in power. Eventually, as it happens in all healing cycles, there will come a time of excretion, certainly, and therefore, from the perspective of both the ruling entity and its obedient bacteria and fungi, there will be losses. Given that there will always be some organs that will return to health and go back to life after they have feasted on their dead matter. Yet these losses being inevitable can, however, be controlled. One who becomes healthy after having its soul tumors eaten goes back to the living and stops providing nourishment to the metaphorical necrophage bacteria of this realm. Unless they can contract a new shock. So, by maximizing the exposure of individuals that would otherwise become healthy again, particularly those who, by awareness, have approached their living state, to the shock's problem, the conflict's reaction, and the presented appeasement solution, they will increase the opportunities or temptations of those souls to suffer new shocks, generate new internal conflicts in reaction, and produce more soul tumor as food for the natives. Like stated previously, during the excretion phase, which will always follow the necrophage feast of soul tumors, there will be a cleanup of debris and many bacteria and fungi will perish and be thrown away, having fulfilled their role in that cycle. Yet, as long as one of the living is here, bearing tumors in their soul, there will be a cycle again, riddled with problems, reactions and solutions, 
to prepare the next feast promised by the entity to the native necrophages. Every time a cycle passes, less and less potential tumors will be available, as more and more living organs return home to health. That is inevitable, and the entity knows it. But it fights and demands and never backs down from attempting to secure a time extension to a realm where it is seen as God, worshipped, obeyed, and also fed. To the necrophage natives of this realm, the feast is victory. To the entity ruling over them, bound by a contract in mutual interest, the feast is also victory. To the living, however, recovered after having their soul cleansed by the soul tumor eaters, the feast is their freedom. Are the native necrophages evil then? Yes and no. Yes, because objectively they are of the false realms and so, being not truth, they are evil. And no, because morally they have done nothing contrary to their nature. Their nature is to eat soul tumors and therefore they fulfill it and maximize it. The entity that rules over them and that struck a deal with them, that one is, on the other hand, undoubtedly evil, both consciously and volitiously. Still, as it prolongs its reign by promoting soul afflictions for its obedient bacteria to feast upon, it is merely delaying the inevitable conclusion. Its own soul, with its ever-growing mass, made up of and accumulated with eternal fears and conflicts and shocks and endless labors and pressures to fight and to succeed, will one day too be feasted upon by its own serfs, the necrophage bacteria, at a time when hunger due to the absence of the living that had slowly and gradually been le leaving back to health, will breach their mutual agreement. The master of ever-hungry puppets is destined to be their climatic and final meal. If anything in this metaphor can be taken seriously, then we are countless individual living organs that can go through cycle after cycle of shock and consequent illness, offering newly generated soul tumors for the feast table, until the day when we understand the core of our soul illness, identification. For only identification with the subject of a problem will cause a shock and a reaction and will yearn for its solution. We are the living, identifying as the dead. We are giants on whose shoulders live maggots, feeding on our blindness. And in their throne room, ruling over them and feeding alongside them, sits a deceiver, whose soul will be, in the end, their last supper.